So our next speaker is uh, is uh, Miriam Meyer, and um, her t talk title is "Designing Visualizations for Biological uh, Data and Obviously Biologists." Right, and uh, that's a very interesting kind of field, uh, which uh, as biology is on the forefront of what's going on, um, this is also on the forefront of what's going on in visualization. So um, we're very happy to have you here. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, well, thanks very much for the introductions, and I'm sorry to bring this up, but my name is Mariah. <laughs> and we talked about it last night over beer, so yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, thanks for everyone for being here and for the invitation to come and talk. Um, I am a assistant professor in the School of Computing at the University of Utah. And I think some of the most interesting research that's happening today in computer science is happening at the intersection with a variety of domains, whether it's climatology, the social sciences, humanities, and most certainly in the life sciences. Um, and as was set up earlier to today in the food talk, um, the, the explosion of quantitative data in biology over the last 10 years has fundamentally changed how scientists in that field are making discoveries. And a really important component of the, dis of the scientific process now is making sense of data using computational methods. Now in my work, um, what I do is I work closely with biologists to develop interactive visualization tools that help them make sense of complex data. Um, I, the, the research I do relies heavily on collaboration, and one of the key things about it is to match the rate of software development to the biologist's rate of experimentation in order to produce agile software that not only can support these scientists, but also influence them as they tackle complex questions. So one such question might be, how do you compare a human and a lizard? Uh, so my uh, collaborator, Manfred Grebherr, is tackling this question by comparing the human genome with that of the lizard and looking for regions of similarity between the two. And ultimately, he hopes these sorts of comparisons will shed light on how our genome encodes who we are. Now, uh, Manfred and I started working together at the point that he was really struggling to make sense of his computational results using off-the-shelf visualization tools. So we worked together for a couple of months, and we developed a tool called MISB. And here I'm just showing you a screen capture from part of that tool. And we're, we are looking at the human genome compared to the lizard. So the way that this encoding works is in the outer ring, we have the human genome. And in the inner ring, we have that of the lizard. Um, the inner ring is also augmented with one user-selected human chromosome that emanates a set of colored lines. And each one of those colored lines represents a region of sequence similarity between our genome and that of a lizard. Um, now, as I said, Manfred was really struggling when we first started working together to understand the sort of results his model was producing. Um, and this is actually an image of the very, very first data set that he loaded into an earlier prototype of MISB. And he told me that he was incredibly shocked when he saw this, as he had no idea that his model was producing so much noise, that there are so many lines going to different places. So he spent a couple of weeks speaking parameters in his algorithm, and he was able to get here. At this point, he decided to take a completely different approach. He designed a brand new model, and that model gave him this data set. Um, now, he published a paper on this algorithm um, two years ago in bioinformatics and released the source code um, to the scientific community. And I asked him how long it would have taken him to make this breakthrough using the methods he had available to him prior to MISB. And what he told me was, honestly, I don't think I ever would have gotten here. Now, today, most biologists are just like Manfred and using uh, computational and visualization tools to make scientific discoveries. But for most of these biologists, their visualization toolbox is made up of only broadly available tools that were really designed for overarching questions. And when I talk to these biologists, what I hear over and over again is that even though they, they can load their data into these tools, they're rarely giving them answers to their specific questions. So in contrast, the tools that I designed are very focused and specific. And I really, um, um, I work hard to understand the mental models of my collaborators and uh, to uh, come up with visual representations that match those mental models. And also to create interfaces that are as simple as possible. One of my sort of overarching philosophies is that the less that my users have to think about the tool, the more time they can spend thinking about their biology. Um, now, the, the sort of impact of this kind of work extends beyond just the tools themselves. Um, and in my research, I use these um, sorts of projects to probe things about um, 
uh, process for conducting this kind of visualization research. So for example, um, by, by reflecting on our experience of working at these interfaces, several colleagues and I um, have developed uh, a, new uh, a, a new approach to visualization research that we call the design study methodology. And this methodology really describes a user-centered, problem-driven process that um, focuses on designing visualization tools for real people with real problems and with real data. And so what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to tell you some more uh, about what this methodology looks like and then illustrate it through um, an example project um, that I worked, um, worked on with some folks um, at the Broad Institute in Cambridge. So, okay, so first of all, well, what is a design study? Um, so a design study is a process that's conducted by visualization researchers where uh, the, the researchers analyze a real world problem, design a visualization system to support solving that problem, validating that design, and finally reflecting about lessons learned in order to understand what are the general principles and generalities that we can get out of this kind of work. What else can we in the community learn from this? So I just want to talk a little bit about what this definition implies. So first of all, there is this, this notion of real world. And uh, because this is about something that exists out there, um, both real users with real data are absolutely mandator mandator uh, mandatory. Mandatory. Um, and collaboration is an absolute fundamental part of doing this kind of um, process. Um, and I should also say that, that design studies are about um, bringing together visualization researchers with uh, domain experts. So it's really a team-based kind of effort. Um, and we do use the word design. And I should say that um, my colleagues and I were all computer scientists. We would, we would never call ourselves designers. But how we, how the, the things that, that we think about from design that are incredibly important in doing this kind of work um, is really, um, in large part, this explicit consideration of multiple alternatives. And so this becomes really important when you're thinking about the sort of very, very broad space of, of design options and how do you know and how do you pull from that to create something that's effective. Um, validation um, is also an absolutely essential part of what we do as researchers. How do we know that the, 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 the things that we chose to put together make sense and that they are effective? So coming up with ways to validate what we do as researchers all the way from characterizing the initial problem through validating the final design is a really key part of this kind of work. And then finally, um, this idea of reflection about what you've learned from this um, sort of leads towards improved design guidelines, whether it's confirmation of principles, creation of new principles, or refinement of those. Um, and we sort of feel that this reflection is really what takes um, an engineering project into the realm of research. So as I said before, what I'm going to do is, um, well, OK, right. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit um, about, uh, about the sort of framework for doing this kind of work. So we came up with this um, nine-stage framework, and, and it kind of looks like a lot. Um, but I'm just going to break it apart a little bit to, um, to give you a feel for what this, this means. And so there's these nine stages. And what this diagram really is meant to imply is a couple of things about the dynamics of doing this work. So first of all, it is shown as a linear set of stages. But these stages are overlapping to imply that it's not that you have to finish any one stage before moving on to the next. There's a lot of things that happen in parallel. And then the gray arrows are meant to indicate that this is also um, like probably very, very rarely a linear process. And there's a lot of jumping backwards in stages. So for example, um, when I go about writing a paper about a project, I'm often going to have to go back to earlier stages and reflect more upon the, the characterization I came up with for a problem in order to clearly articulate something or to question the decisions I made. Um, but what we do say is that um, you, you, you can't really jump over a stage. So for example, um, it makes no sense to jump into the design stage if you haven't already worked um, hard and thought deeply about what is the problem you're even designing for. So, um, so that's sort of the, the dynamics that occur in this framework. So we have, there's three main, um, there's three main state, uh, uh, phases of this. The first one is the precondition phase. And here, these are really the stages that you have to do before you can even start working on a project. Um, the very, very beginning of this whole um, framework is about learning the space of, what's of, what, of methods and techniques that we have for looking at data and interacting with it. 
Um, so if you don't actually know what that space of things are, um, it's, it's highly unlikely that you're going to end up pulling, from, um, pulling the most effective types of methods that you could use to solve your problem. Um, this is also included in this is also about how do you pick good collaborations and problems for visualization research. The middle stages is really sort of the heart and soul of a design study. And this is where you actually go in and get your hands dirty and work on a project. And I'll talk about this in more detail in the talk, in the rest of the talk. And then finally at the end, we have what we call the analysis stages. And this is where we do our analytical reasoning. And again, this is where we reflect on things that we've learned in order to contribute back to the broader research community. Okay, so as I said, um, I'm going to talk in more detail about these sort of core steps. I'm going to do so by illustrating it, um, by walking you through a project um, that I worked on to develop a tool called Pathline. Okay, so the first step in here is the discover stage. So discover is really about characterizing the problem, um, understanding the, the sorts of measurements and experiments that your users um, have conducted and are collecting, and also deeply understanding the kinds of questions and intuitions that they have about their science. Um, and from there, we take those, those sorts of questions and the experimental measurements and create an abstraction of data analysis tasks and data types. Um, and sometimes some of my collaborators have referred to this step as data counseling, because this is really, for me as a visualization researcher, going in and helping them to clearly articulate what is it that they really need to do in the data. You know, you, you can't really start with a question which is, well, I want to cure cancer. Well, okay, well, what does that mean? So it's really about helping them to break apart bits and pieces of this larger question into individual things that can be solvable. Okay, so in the context of this, this, uh, this project I'm going to tell you about, we'll start here with functional genomics. So functional genomics is a field that's been around for a while. And at a high level, scientists working in this field are really interested in answering this question, which is how do genes work together um, to perform different functions in a cell? And these scientists tend to work with two main kinds of data, gene expression and molecular pathways. So first, what's gene expression? So gene expression is basically just a measured level of how much a gene is on or off in a cell. It's also just a single quantitative value. So biologists tend to measure it for many different genes and in many different samples, where these samples can be different type points, different tissue types, different experiments, and so on. Um, now, in biology, this kind of data is nearly universally visualized using a heat map encoding, where you basically encode each value in this table with a color. Um, and these heat maps are most often augmented with clustering algorithms to try to pull out trends and patterns in the data. All right, so molecular pathways. Now, the functioning that goes on inside of all the cells in our body um, are con is controlled by many interrelated chemical reactions that are performed by genes, or more precisely, the products of genes that we call proteins. So what happens is there's some sort of input to the cell, like this orange dot, let's say it's something like glucose. Glucose is then going to be acted on by a set of genes um, in, a, in a reaction that produces some sort of output, like the blue output, that's then an input to another reaction, and so on. So at the end of the string of reactions, you end up with some sort of function like metabolism. But the reality of these kinds of reactions is actually much, much, much more complicated. Um, and this is even just a small subset of all the known reactions that occur in the cell. So this ends up being a very large network. And so this, this is way too much information for biologists to really parse and make sense of. So they end up breaking these networks down into much smaller graphs that they call a pathway. And so a pathway is going to be a directed graph that's on the order of a dozen reactions or fewer. So this is where I fit into NetSci. Okay, so um, the field of functional genomics has been around for a while, and there's scientists that are really starting to push the, the boundaries and developing a new field called comparative functional genomics. And here, they really want to understand how these gene interactions are varying across multiple species. So um, in this project, we were collaborating with a group of pioneers in this field, um, the Regev Lab at the Broad Institute, which is a large biological institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And this group was really interested in studying metabolism in yeast. So they had spent several years collecting data for multiple genes at multiple time points in multiple related species. And they wanted to understand all of that in the context of multiple pathways. So the problem they had was that 
Existing tools can only look at a subset of this data at a time. And so the goal we had in designing Pathline was to create an integrative system that will allow them to explore all this data together in context. Okay, so um, the process that we went through in this, in this early initial, this discovery stage, um, was we conducted a series of semi-structured and contextual interviews. So basically we spent a lot of time in conversation with these biologists, asking them questions and also looking at the kinds of tools they were using, the sort of workflows they had in place to really understand what they were trying to do and what the challenges were. Um, in this in initial stage, we were working with four biologists. Two of them were experiment experimentalists and two of them were computational. Um, and we were meeting with them roughly three to four hours per week over a month. Um, and we were very much con um, conducting this initial problem characterization in parallel with the later design stage. Okay, so um, from, from, our, uh, from our interviews, we came up with an abstraction of the kinds of data this group was working with. Um, and here we, we sort of learned that they were working with four main kinds of data. So the first kind of data was um, these metabolic pathways. And so they were looking at roughly 10 to 50 pathways of interest that they were studying. Um, the inputs and outputs to the reactions or the nodes of this graph, they call metabolites. And this data is represented as a directed graph. They also had collected lots of gene expression data for 6,000 genes and 140 metabolites. They'd done so at six different time points in the growth cycle of yeast and collected this for 14 related species of yeast. And this information was represented as a 3D table of values. So then they had the phylogeny of these um, species, which basically represented their evolutionary relationship. This data is represented as a binary tree. And finally, because they were trying to, to make sense of this, this large complex data set, they were doing some computation and co computing something that they called similarity scores. So a similarity score is an aggregate of a time series for a gene or metabolite over the species. I I'll tell you what that means. So let's say we were looking at gene number one and we take the time series of expression data for each species and we push it through some sort of aggregation function that then spits out a number. And what that number tells us is how similar is that expression across all the species. So the higher the value, the more similar each one of those different species were expressing that gene. So there's many, many, many different ways that you could come up with an aggregation function to compute this. And they were initially doing some pretty off-the-shelf methods using things like Pearson and Spearman correlation. But they really suspected that ultimately there was going to be some more biologically based metrics that would ultimately be more informative to the questions they were asking. And so this data is represented as quantitative values. So this was our, our abstraction of the sorts of experimental measurements that they had conducted. So it was about going from sort of bio the, the language of biology into the language of um, computer science. So we, we performed a, a similar kind of analysis on the, the tasks that we needed to support. And here I'm just giving you a very high level flavor for what those tasks were. So at a lowest level, they really wanted to study that gene expression data as time series as opposed to individual values because they were really interested in the dynamics that were occurring in the cells. At the next level up, they wanted to be able to compare a limited number of time series at once, whether it was for a gene across the species. The next level up, they then wanted to look at, mult at similarity scores along the pathways to understand trends about where were the gene expression, where was gene expression um, being, or where were genes being expressed similarly across the species in different pathways. And finally, they wanted to look at multiple similarity scores in large part because of this problem that they weren't quite sure what the right um, metrics were to use to compute these yet. Whew, okay, so. Um, now I'm just going to give you a real uh, brief overview of um, the tool and how all this data fits in. So um, this is just a screenshot from Pathline and it has two main views. On the left we have what we call as a linearized pathway representation and on the right we have a more detailed curve map display. And I'll tell you about these things in more detail in a minute. So we're showing the metabolic pathways or those directed graphs actually as an ordered list of nodes down the vertical axis and then we show similarity scores as position along the horizontal axis. Um, we show it as um, the length of lines for the metabolites and the position of circles for the genes. We then are showing that temporal gene expression data in this curve map, which is augmented by the phylogenetic relationship of the species. Okay, so how did we actually get to the design? So 
Now we're in the sort of design stage. So this stage is really about continuing in, in, in what, what do we need to, what sort of data abstractions do we need? Or like how do we need to transform our data to get it into a form that's suitable for the representations we want to show? What are those visual representations and what kinds of interactions do we want to support for exploration? And again, this is really where, where we start thinking about this very, very broad consideration space, the whole space of everything that we could do with this data and winnowing that space down to a very narrow um, proposal space of things that we want to try, whether it's through paper prototyping or software prototyping, to get feedback from our users from. So I just want to start with this, this idea that design is not a matter of taste. It's not, I didn't say this, a designer said this. Um, but I, I very much uh, agreed with this statement. So I, I'm an engineer, and as an engineer, I really rely on rules and principles to build things. And it turns out that we know a lot about how to visually represent data in an effective way. So a lot of the really early visualization research, and by early I mean back in the 80s, so not really that long ago, it's a young field. But a lot of this early research looked at the basic fundamental visual encoding channels that we have for showing data. Um, so for example, here I'm showing you the basic channels we have for encoding numbers. So a lot of these early researchers also conducted controlled laboratory experiments to understand which kinds of encodings are easiest for us to interpret. So it turns out for numbers that color is actually the hardest encoding channel for us to use to accurately compare quantitative numbers, whereas spatial encodings such as position or length are actually the best. So in going into um, designing Pathline, we went in really with this idea, which is that we wanted to encode quantitative values with spatial position wherever we could. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that instead of showing these molecular pathways in this typical node link graph and then layering information on top of this with um, color, um, where, so basically here you're using spatial position to show the topology of the graph, we instead decided we um, would come up with a way to linearize these, these pathways so that we could then show quantitative data as position along the horizontal axis. And also, instead of showing the gene expression data using the typical heat map encoding, we developed this, um, this matrix layout of these time curves. Okay, so I'll give you just even a few more details about these representations. So first, this linearized pathway representation. So I just want to show you a little bit about um, the sort of starting point where we started from when we were going in and doing these contextual interviews with the biologists, how they were you know, going about trying to make sense of this data. So to begin with, one of the very, very first things that they um, put together was they put together um, large posters like this, where down the middle um, we have a sort of very typical representation of a pathway. Um, and then off to the side, they were augmenting each ones of the, the edges or the nodes with these little mini heat maps. So basically this was them trying to put gene expression into the context of these pathways. And they quickly found that it was really hard to understand trends that happened across those heat maps in the context of these, this, this larger pathway representation. So one thing, this is what led them to computing the similarity scores. So then they would come up with these more simplified versions of these pathways and then layer the similarity score on top using color. Um, they were using a rainbow color map, which is you know, actually one of, one of the, the least effective color maps you can, you can use due to a variety of perceptual um, problems with it. Um, but besides, we, you know, we knew that color was not going to be an easy way for us to make um, effective comparisons. So this is really where we came up with this idea of trying to linearize these pathways such that then we could use spatial position to show quantitative numbers. So, um, so our main idea was that we really wanted a common axis in order to compare similarity scores. So again, pathways go down the, the vertical axis, similarity scores along the horizontal. Um, and we use two different visual encodings, bars and circles. So um, the bars are for metabolites or basically the nodes in our graph. And the circles are for um, the reactions, which can be made up of multiple genes, and that's what the circles are. And this was really because we had conversations with the group where some people in the group were like, well, can you just have a button to get rid of the genes? And other people were like, oh, can you have a button to get rid of the metabolites? But we discovered that if we, we, we wanted to keep them both there, so you can either focus on trends in the lines or focus on trends in the circles, but they're together for context. <coughs> 
Um, and then this also allowed us to um, use color to encode the direction of the genes. Um, the um, common axis then also supported looking at multiple similarity scores at once, and as well as multiple pathways. So we're actually looking at three different pathways in this view. So one question is, of course, how do we actually get to this linearized representation? So let's say we started with a pathway that looked like this, where we have a cycle, a branch. <coughs> again, the metabolites are the nodes of the graph, and the edges are the genes. And again, it can be multiple genes in one edge because it's really representing a reaction. So the first thing we do is we unroll the cycle, and we cut out the branch. We then reinsert the branch and indicate where the branch points are. Then um, in, in the pathline representation, we convert the nodes of the graph to those horizontal bars and the edges of the graph to the circles. Um, and then um, we include these stylized marks to show um, branch points um, with those sort of um, hooks and the cycles with that lollipop symbol. Um, and then we can use the horizontal position for quantitative data. Um, so, um, Talking about the design process, I just wanted to show you a little bit of some of the different kinds of ideas we played with before coming up with that final design. So the first thing we did is we looked at sort of the orientation of the pathways. Is it easier to read these things if they're horizontal or vertical, as well as different kinds of marks to make to represent the data? So we tried a couple of different things. We turned it the other way. Um, we were trying to distinguish between the metabolites, which here are going to be these squares versus the genes. Um, and then we decided this idea of actually changing the visual encoding there. Um, we also played with a variety of ways of showing branches. So we tried some ideas for showing them hierarchically, sort of as this, as this nested kind of idea. We also tried sort of drop boxes where you can, you can click to have things um, collapse or expand. Um, and then we sort of hit on the idea of using different kinds of stylized marks and we tried a variety of those sorts of ways. And then ultimately ended up with this design. So just, um, just one thing to, to, to sort of summarize about this is that here we're using spatial position to show quantitative values as opposed to the topology of those pathways. And this is in part because for our, for our collaborators, they were just studying you know, a couple dozen pathways that they already had really good mental models about. So all of that topology is encoded here, but it's really secondary information. So it's really about matching our representation to the needs of this specific group. Okay, so the curve map. All right, so right, so they were using heat maps with this fantastic red green color map, and it turns out 10% of the male population can't even read this. Um, biologists are no exception to that rule. So basically, the genes were going down the the horizontal or the vertical, and then each one of these sort of small columns is a time series and then they group these into this um, larger thing for, for different species. And the task was really to take these time series across the species and make some sort of statements about which ones are the same, which ones are different, and how are they different. I'd argue it's not, that's non-trivial. So the idea of the curve map was inspired by this notion of a heat map, where, um, but instead of the base visual unit being a single block of color, our base visual unit is going to be a curve. Um, where we show um, gene expression versus time. So we use these filled frame line charts in order to enhance the perception of the shape of the curves. And in Pathline, we use a matrix style layout to look at many of these curves at once, where the rows are going to be different species and the columns are user selected genes and metabolites. We then also augment the matrix display with these overlay plots, um, both along the rows and the columns, in order to um, enhance the perception of trends within a set of the the curves. Okay, so uh, the way that we got to that, that encoding was basically this idea that they were looking at temporal dynamics, so we really wanted our sort of base visual unit to, to be something that looked at, at these things over time. So once we decided we wanted to look at time curves, it turns out there's many, many different ways to draw a time curve. As a computer scientist, this kind of blew my mind. Who knew? So basically, um, one of my collaborators who was a designer went into Illustrator and mocked up about 20 different ways to show time curves. We printed off this big poster and we looked at it, and when we saw those ones all the way on the right, we were just like, yes. That is a, that, the, in that one, the shapes of these curves absolutely pop out, and that was really matched what our collaborators were looking to do. And so yeah, so here's the sort of uh, final design in the tool. 
Okay, so that was the design stage. So the next stage in this pipeline is really about implementing. And here, this is about rapid software prototyping. So basically, writing, writing code as fast as you can with the notion that you're probably going to throw it away, simply to get to the point where you have something interactive to give to your collaborators to get feedback as soon as possible. Um, actually, what I'm going to show you here is a demo. It's, I call it a prototype, but it does function. Okay, so uh, this is Pathline in action. So we've loaded in um, a variety of different pathways over here on the left. And uh, we can populate the curve map display by selecting um, genes or metabolites of interest over here. So let's just select some. We also on rollover get more information about um, these nodes in the pathway. Um, and then, so over here you can, so these two views are linked together not only through that interaction, but you can also think that if you were to take any one of these columns, let's say the column for M1, you roll up that column into a single value that says how similar are all the curves in that column. That is actually the similarity score that's being plotted over here on the right. So these two views are also linked together that way. So then we can roll over the, the labels for the genes and, and see them highlighted in the overlay plots. Same goes for the species, as well as even for the clades of the tree. Um, we can also look at multiple similarity scores, three different similarity scores at once in this pathway representation. Okay, that's the 10 second overview. Okay, so the last step in this, in this project phase is validate. Um, and this is absolutely critical um, in order to understand what worked and why. Um, and so this is all about releasing your prototypes or releasing your tools um, to your users um, in the wild, as we like to say, um, and to gather feedback from them about how they use the tool, how does it compare to their workflows before, et cetera. So in my work, um, I rely heavily on a validation method called case studies. And case studies are a qualitative research method that um, are about an in-depth study of an individual or a group of people, and most importantly, doing this study in a real world setting. So the result of a case study is going to be a description of what was going on in that environment, in this case how they were using the tool, what kinds of findings did they have, and then an interpretation of what those um, insights and, and findings sort of lead to about what can I learn from this as a, as a visualization researcher. So we had a couple of, um, a couple of case studies from this project and I'm just going to tell, tell you about one. And I should say that we had to anonymize this data at the request of our collaborators because in part many of the case studies that we came up with um, sort of led to follow-up experiments that they're now writing a manuscript on. So this data hasn't been published yet. But okay, so one of these case studies involved these three genes, genes 5, 6, and 7. And you can see from the similarity scores that gene 5 and gene 6 have pretty low values indicating that the gene expression is quite different across the species, which is in contrast to that of gene 7. And when you look at the curve map display, you see a similar thing. When you look down the curves for gene 5, they look quite different, which is in contrast to that for gene 7. So this was something that the group knew about before, and these three sets of genes were one of the first things they looked at in an early prototype of this tool. Um, and what it allowed them to do was to confirm that they could see previously known information in this new representation. And what they said was this sort of analysis would have taken on the order of 30 minutes to do with a heat map display but for them was immediately obvious um, in this tool. Another uh, uh, trend that they knew about was the pairwise relationship for gene 5 and gene 6. So if you look at these curves as you go down the species, you see that the curves look nearly identical. Again, something the group knew about and something they looked for right away. But then they actually saw something that they didn't know, and that was the relationship for species 7. They had never seen this before and weren't aware that it existed. So they went in and did follow-up experiments and actually discovered that this difference is due to a, um, a previously unknown gene duplication event in the ancient history of um, this species of yeast. So <clears throat> this case study allowed us to show that not only could they do previously uh, do, do, do things that they could do before much more um, efficiently, but it also allowed them to see something that they didn't know about. So I just want to um, say that if anyone's interested, you can get um, this, this, uh, the source code's open source. You can download it from this website along with executables and example data. So um, in the 
because of time, I'm just going to skip um, ahead to just saying a few sort of closing um, remarks. Um, just some of the things that, that I, a few high level things that I've learned um, from doing these kinds of projects. Um, the first one is actually related to uh, what we heard about in um, the first keynote today, um, this idea of long tail. And what I have found that within biology, there's a lot of long tail data analysis. So many of the sorts of both computational and visualization tools that are designed to do analysis in biology, again, are designed for the small subset of things that most biologists might want to do. But it's really those very specific kinds of research questions that the individual investigators have that are going to lead to our sort of leaps in knowledge um, that we need to support. And working on these kinds of focused problems um, is, is really, I think, the way we need to go forward to think about how do we support um, data analysis in biology. Um, but with that said, also the idea that designing for scientists is fundamentally different than designing for the general public. If anyone in here has created, we've already seen some examples of visualization, visualizations that um, are geared to the more general public. Um, a couple years ago at our annual visualization conference, the director of the New York Times graphics department, Matthew Erickson, gave a keynote. And one of the things that I remember him talking about was how the New York Times will never publish a scatter plot because a scatter plot is just too difficult, it's too abstract to interpret. Now since then I've seen one or two, but they're always highly annotated. And so this is just fundamentally the sort of, the, the, the visual literacy of the scientific population is quite different than the general public, which opens up a whole space of kind of design ideas that we can pull from. But also that they're highly, highly motivated. So you don't really have to worry about trying to bring them in and inspire them. They want to use your tools. So, um, yeah, so, so they're very trainable as well, which is great. Um, and so I just want to end with saying that um, I think that thoughtful visualizations really have the potential to, um, to not only support but to also influence scientists when they're in these sorts of early stages of data analysis. But to do so, I think we have to move beyond this idea that visualization is about pretty pictures and instead to embrace that it's really about a deep investigation into sense making. Um, with that, I want to say thanks for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Very, very, very nice. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have um, three minutes. I would say we could also do six minutes, and then we have a shorter coffee break of 20 minutes, which I think is still enough, right? So I think we should do some more questions. Um, sorry? OK. So. Um, Maybe I, I start with one question as an art historian. Um, this is a very interesting topic. Um, in, the, in the 16th century, there was a guy the, called the Nomenist woman, the unknown Italian A uh, of Vienna, Albertina, who came up with a way to uh, visualize the vault structure in ground plans. So if he does an X, it would be a cross vault. And if he does a semicircle in a rectangle, rectangular room, it would notify actually to be a barrel vault. And Serlio, famous, uh, he misunderstood the semicircles with, uh, with basically niches in these rooms, and then uh, basically he filled in the, the vaults, and then ever since, uh, most of these buildings are drawn with niches, right? <laughs> so uh, I think there is one thing when we come up with new conventions, which uh, is very necessary, uh, catering to a small audience. We, um, we, we encountered a problem that once we actually um, um, put these things to the public, so once the New York Times actually publishes a scatter plot, like they did one two weeks ago, which actually, I think it's a D3 demo also, where uh, they, they have to explain the logarith what's a logarithmic scale and whatever. So, so, so basically, if you read the article, you spend like two thirds of your time with actually learning about what's a logarithmic scatter plot, right? And like very little about like the countries that the plots is about. So uh, the question is, um, what's your experience of like, do you, do you, do you experience that hurdle um, going towards the public? And how much of that is actually picked up even in journals like Nature Science and so on? So biologists submit probably papers with these kinds of things. What, do, what does the journal say? Do they say, Give us the heat map, please, or... Uh... <laughs> well, I, I should preference with saying that um, I have never actually worked on projects that have a public face. So I've been very fortunate that I just get those highly motivated 
um, high visual literacy end users. Um, but I, I think it's a really hard, really hard um, question. Um, on this issue of, of uh, what, what, do sign, what do my collaborators do with these? Because ultimately they, they need to publish in some sort of print 2D kind of static thing. And this is a really hard problem because sort of as Isabel and I were talking at lunch, like none of these visualizations show you the whole data set at once. That's sort of not the point. The point is to support exploration. So one, one thing that, that, we've been, that we've done on several projects now that's been really effective is to actually include um, an executable with the data um, with their, with their um, submission. And in fact, one, one paper that just came out in uh, um, PLOS Genetics last year, the reviewers actually commented in the review how thankful they were to have this tool to play around with. So basically, we created a bunch of um, just sort of input files that, that would sort of set the tool in the exact state of a figure in the um, paper. So basically, they could start from the sort of known place and then kind of explore away from there, um, hopefully to sort of confirm what the, the, the biologists were sort of claiming in this paper. But the reviewers actually really appreciated that. And I think it's absolutely essential um, as we sort of are dealing with more complex data that we can't really just summarize in a simple diagram. Um, but I think from an implementation standpoint, that brings up this question of having to create lightweight tools that, again, don't need a lot of description because a reviewer isn't going to spend 45 minutes like learning how to use a tool. And so it's sort of this, this having very intuitive, easy to use tools that are lightweight enough to share that I think can be quite effective. Uh, thank you very much. Very nice work. So I would like to hear more about the actual the, the struggles you had in the design process. You laid out the discover, design, implementation, and deploy. But I know from my experience that uh, most often, you know, you, you know, the, the backward arrows are the thicker than the linear <laughs> process, right? I, I, it looks I, I, nice in presentation, Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So yeah. could you comment more on the actual, you know, what's going on in, yeah. in yeah, real design actually, process? If I can jump on that, I also actually want to ask the same question. Could you talk, if you could talk a little bit about the iteration, yeah. you know, how, how did you go back in terms of uh, breaking to exactly those conventions and how after the familiarity or how it was not bought, you know, all these exactly. So we had exactly the same question. Yeah, okay. So so Pathline, the project I showed you is not a good example because that actually went pretty linearly. That was, that was, and I think in large part, I think in large part because I was working closely with a designer. I think that's why. So by the time we got to the implement stage, we had already tried out all the designs. But, um, or his name is Bang Wong. I mean, what, what, what part of the team? A designer, a graphic designer? Or uh, yeah, he's actually trained as a medical illustrator, but also a biologist. Throw in the idea whether you work with a graphic designer or anything like that as well. I, re I repeat for the record. Yeah. I repeat for the okay. record. So um, the question is a graphic designer or. Um, you said it's a medical designer. Okay. This guy, in, in, I guess a lot of what he does is graphic design work. Um, that he's wasn't his. Have I thought about working with a graphic designer? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd say that the, 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 the collaborator on that project, I, I, I'm not a designer, so I'm not completely familiar with the sort of the subspecialties, but he did, a, he did a lot of graphic design work, and um, I think in general that's been very influential in my work. Um, but, oh, the process, right. Okay, so, um, so for example, um, one tool um, that's still kind of an ongoing project, um, to get to the point where we had a tool that we published a, a visualization paper on, was a two-year project with um, three fully functioning different prototypes before we finally hit on that final thing. And so the hardest part was really about this constantly going back to that kind of discover. Like really, what are the problems here that they're trying to solve, and, and what are the analysis tasks and the data transformations we can come up with to tease out those things? And so um, it was sort of going on in conjunction with this Pathline project. So this other project was with some fruit fly collaborators, and they also had gene expression data. And one of the, the sort of PIs on that project is a guy named Michael Eisen, who in biology is known as the heat map guy. So in, in the meantime, we'd sort of been developing this idea of a curve map display. So I took it to the biologist that I was working with, this woman named Angela. And I was like, so Angela, we have this new way of looking at temporal gene expression. She was like, well. I hear your point, and that makes a lot of sense, but maybe we could have a button that goes, that you can switch between the heat map versus the curve map. So um, this idea of introducing, I think, new visual representations is something that takes time. So what we did in that, in that case is we had a heat map, 
And then we were sort of augmenting it with these overlay plots. And it turned out they started using the overlay plots more than the heat map. And so then finally, in the final prototype, she was kind of like, let's just put those curve maps in. So then when she was working on the manuscript with Michael Eisen and others, um, she at some point was talking to him about the figures in the paper where they used curve maps instead of heat maps. And she was just like, you know, are you OK with that? And he was like, you know, I really think it's the right way to look at this data. That was perhaps one of the most satisfying things about that whole project and something that I felt really validated um, going back to you know, visualization first principles and that, um, that you, you can get people to see, um, to see things in new ways. It's not something you can just push on them or do overnight, but ultimately first principles went out. Very, very nice. I think we have to stop the, okay, one last question. Actually, we are, we are, we are, we are really over time now. So uh, whatever, we do one more question and a very short one, please. And uh, then we go for the coffee break and meet at, uh, at, at 3.20. Uh, great, great work, by the way, thank you. Um, I want to ask like, if you ever think of using these visualizations as a uh, interface, like to to do to manipulate the actual processes of you know in the gene biology work. You yeah, mean like having turning the visualization into an actual interface to like you know I click on something it something biological happens I don't know how these th things work. <laughs> sort of sort of I an interface to an automatic experiment generating machine. I, that sounds pretty awesome. I think I mean I think there's been lots of work that's been or is is trying to be done on how to automate um, experiments and even sort of dashboards and things for um, for coming up with new experimental designs, you know, electronic notebooks and stuff. I think there's a lot of work that's being done, particularly in the human-computer interaction community on that. So. Very nice. Let's thank her again.